Thank you. So as you said, I'm Connor. Uh, I'm going to talk about how we re-index Elasticsearch at Shopify and how we handle like mapping changes for developers and such. And yeah, so uh, I work in Montreal, Canada. Uh, I almost missed this conference because my flight was canceled, but I, here I am. So. <laughs> so a little bit about Shopify, who, for those who don't know about us, Shopify is an e-commerce platform that provides everything you need to sell online, uh, in social media, or in person. We have merchants that sell a lot of products with us, and bigger brands like Kylie Cosmetics, Jeffree Star, Allbirds, uh, Fashion Nova, and 800,000 other businesses. Collectively, they've sold over $100 billion in gross merchant volume, and we have about 4,000 employees right now. So just to give a better sense of the scale of Shopify in the last few years, last Black Friday, about 10% of online sales were through us, and five years ago, that was below 1%. So it's pretty crazy growing that quickly. I've only been there two years. Uh, so yeah, so today, what I'm going to talk about, first of all, is how we run Elasticsearch at Shopify for all of our development teams. Uh, then a little bit about our Shopify core topology, which is our main Rails monolith. If you aren't aware, Shopify is really big in the Rails community, uh, and we love monoliths. Uh, fight me, <laughs> but uh, what re-indexing is and like what it means to us, how we re-index Elasticsearch, and then our future plans and improvements for this. So yeah, so Elasticsearch at Shopify. I'm on a team of six engineers at Shopify called the Search Platform, uh, which seems to be a common name for this team at other companies as well. We have over 60 Elasticsearch clusters at Shopify that I know of uh, that use our tooling. Uh, and to do run these Elasticsearch clusters, we use a Kubernetes controller we built for Search. Uh, you can see all of our clusters there, most are pretty small, but then our largest cluster there, which is for the Shopify core monolith in Rails, uh, has 50 billion documents, more or less. And let's look a little bit more at that. So this Elasticsearch cluster is set up in an active-active setup uh, and fully replicated across two regions for resiliency purposes. So if we have a GCP outage, which happened a couple weeks ago, uh, we can simply fail over to the other region and hopefully nothing is affected. Each region has about 90 nodes and hits about 100,000 queries per minute at peak during the day. Uh, we route all documents or all queries by shop ID and we shard all shops by shop ID. Uh, so a single shard in Elasticsearch has all the documents for a single shop, which is, uh, it's okay, it could be done better. And we run everything with one replica per shard and zoned across three zones in each region. So if we lose a region, then we're not going to lose access to the documents, but they might not be replicated. So looking at Shopify core now, there's hundreds of services at Shopify, and the largest is Shopify core. Uh, it's a pretty conventional Rails monolith, uh, and we shard the monolith by shop ID as well, which is convenient. And it's 99% ran in Kubernetes. Uh, we made the shift from data centers to Kubernetes in 2017. And the only thing left in the data centers is some load balancing tooling, uh, which as well is for resiliency against GCP outages. Um, so we run those, those, we run in three regions. One is US Central, US East, and then also North America, Northeast one. Uh, it's special because one, it's in Montreal, where I live, and also it runs a, lot, a large portion of the Canadian legal cannabis sales. Uh, so we're not going to talk about the Canada region anymore because of legal restrictions, but we'll talk more about the structure of Shopify Core. So, what you're looking at here is pretty much the structure of a single region of that Shopify core application. Uh, it powers all of our online store functionality at Shopify, and a pod, in this case, is not the same as a Kubernetes pod. Uh, we came up with the terminology of pods before we moved to Kubernetes. Uh, this is a Shopify pod, though. A Shopify, for us. Shopify pod for us is the logical grouping of all sharded components uh, that's necessary to run a Shopify. Um, and so this includes stuff like MySQL, Redis, caches, uh, and some cron utilities. And notice that like, the web servers and search infrastructure is a shared resource um, web because scaling web doesn't fit well with this pod architecture, and search because uh, it's prohibitively expensive to run. Like, we have hundreds of pods. It'd be expensive to run hundreds of Elasticsearch clusters compared to two large Elasticsearch clusters. So just kind of like seeing how a request flows through this big Rails application, uh, it goes through these web workers, which is then routed to the correct pod, and then queries will go to the MySQL query, and so like if a shop is on pod two, it can't query resources on pod three. Um, and just like, the reason I'm going over this is that it plays a big role in how we re-index uh, quickly, since we can horizontally scale these pods, and thus horizontally scale our re-indexation. Um, finally, then when search queries happen, they go to the shared search resource, and back to the um, 
user that's buying things online. So what is re-indexing now? So re-indexing at Shopify for us, um, well, first of all, we have a lot of developers at Shopify, and we have give them a lot of freedom for when they're working with Elasticsearch so they can add new fields, modify analyzers, uh, delete indices, create indices, or change existing fields. And when that happens, uh, as you know, with Elasticsearch, you have to migrate all that data to a new version of the index. Uh, so especially like if you add a new field, you have to backfill that data. And so for re-indexing for us is the process of migrating that data from one index version, the old version, to the new version, putting that new version into production, and serving that to the merchants and buyers. Uh, this is different from real-time indexing, which is what happens when like, you create a product in your online store admin, and then it gets indexed for a search, and then people can search for it and buy it. This is whenever we actually change the mapping, and we want to move all that data to a new version of the index. So um, I'm going to go through kind of like a scenario of me being a product developer and adding a new uh, fancy analyzer for autocomplete to like a product title field. Um, and we want to get this index mapping change into production as quickly as possible. So we kind of start with writing the spy com this Slack command. Uh, we have this Slack chatbot called Spy. Uh, we have a pretty like, broad chat ops infrastructure. There's blog posts on our engineering blog if you want to read more about that. But we can do everything from like failovers, uh, bot blocking bots, load shedding, uh, traffic statistics, starting reindexes. So here I am typing spy es reindex start product, and that starts a reindex for the product strategy. Um, we use the term strategy uh, instead of indices in terms of reindexation because we have multi language search. So when I reindex the product strategy, it actually reindexes products, products Japanese index, and so on. So um, right after that reindex starts, uh, we have to create a new alias and a new um, and apply templates to that alias. So the new templates, uh, or the template for this new mapping is already in Elasticsearch, which was merged by a developer when they added that title analyzer. Uh, and the current index, products.0, um, well, first of all, we, we go through and we use like a monotonically increasing version number for indices in Elasticsearch. So there's products.0, which in this case is the only index available in Elasticsearch right now. And the product's alias points to it. And then whenever we want to create uh, this new mapping with a new analyzer, it's products.1 and has the products.new alias. So when we index data for the re-index, we point to the products.new alias, and search results are still served from the products alias, and real-time indexing is still done with the products alias. So now we're ready to start moving documents from MySQL to Elasticsearch uh, and start denormalizing data from MySQL so that they can be in this denormalized format for Elasticsearch. So at Shopify, um, all re-indexing loads happen in the monolith, and it's done through a structure of um, like a very concurrent structure of this coordinator job and all these worker jobs that they create. Uh, all of this is done in active job in Rescue. So if you know anything about Rails, uh, you're probably familiar with active job, which is like a, a background job framework for Ruby on Rails. And Rescue is the adapter for that to actually work on those jobs. So first we create a coordinator job per pod which, remember, one of these pods, it runs off of Redis with the rescue adapter on top of Redis. Uh, we create this coordinator job, then the coordinator job will create a worker job uh, for every single shop. So overall, we're creating 800,000 jobs. Uh, of course, those don't all run at the same exact time. We do throttle so we don't take down Shopify every time we re-index. So to avoid scheduling too many uh, jobs on too many shops at one time, uh, first of all, we limit it to 300 jobs running at one time per pod, which ends up being about 30,000 to 50,000 jobs in total on the platform at once when we're re-indexing. And we also read all data from the MySQL read replicas so we don't take down the writer. Uh, likewise, each coordinator job has a, um, it keeps track of its progress, so it will report back to the, um, so the worker's job will tick that progress bar for each coordinator job. Once the re-index is complete, we should see that 100% of these jobs completed. We'll see which ones failed, and we need to retry those jobs if we need to. And by doing that, we can set SLOs based on what percent of a pod shops are re-indexed. So likewise, again, if you're familiar with Rescue and Active Job, uh, this strategy won't work uh, because we'll create too many jobs even with limiting it to 300 jobs at a time and we'll take down rescue and other jobs won't get time to run uh, because that's not, rescue is not a scheduling system, it's just a job working system. And so 
this is where the iteration API comes in hand. So the iteration API is a um, extension for active job, which makes jobs interruptible and resumable, and saves progress that all the jobs have made. Uh, so in this case, for us, like a job can run for a maximum of 120 seconds per iteration, at which point they're paused at the current cursor position and re and will continue with the next time quantity they get. And the way this looks when you're writing a job in Shopify uh, is you split the job into two sections, the collection you want to process, and you build an enumerator. So in this case, we pull up our strategy, get all documents in batches, and then you want to apply an action, which for us is producing the build documents to Kafka. Um, all jobs at Shopify use this API, and we also share the same rescue workers with all other jobs at Shopify. So uh, we have to make sure that we don't take up their, their fair share of work as well, because that includes stuff like billing and checkouts. So looking here, this is a time series diagram of us running a reindex with all of these worker jobs. Uh, you can see like the darker yellow at, near the bottom is this reindex starting and getting to run and not taking up the rest like all of the available reindex, uh, not all the available rescue worker pool workers at one time, and, but we still get our good fair share of running and we limit it that 300 jobs at a time. So we have these jobs and we've started these jobs and they're running, uh, and now we wanna index the data into Elasticsearch from within that job. And you saw a hint of that with the produce to Kafka line, uh, but now we'll talk a little bit more about that because it goes deeper than Kafka. So we have all the Shopify rescue workers in this diagram. Uh, on each host in one GCP region. And whenever we produce to Kafka initially, it actually produces to a system five message queue, uh, which runs on every single host and is shared by all of the rescue workers running on that host. Uh, then, we, then we have a tool called Kafka Bridge, which runs and pulls from that system five queue, produces to the Kafka regional, which uses Kafka Mirror Maker to share it to the Kafka aggregate cluster, uh, which is not within a single region, it's shared among all regions. And then our Elasticsearch clusters will read from the Kafka aggregate into Elasticsearch. Uh, so digging, out a little, digging into that a little bit more, the reason we use this Kafka aggregate is it pretty much guarantees that we have uh, full replication across both regions, since Kafka has the concept of like consumer offsets and committing offsets. If we fail to uh, consume a certain batch of documents, then we're not gonna lose track of those documents and we'll know that like the East region is, you know, it's indexed all these offsets and so as a central region and thus we can believe that both regions are fully replicated. Um, and then also the reason we use the system five message queue uh, is kind of like a resiliency tool that helps the on call a little bit. Uh, so if, for example, if Kafka were to go down, which it does occasionally, uh, then the Shopify rescue workers can continue working and producing documents to Kafka. Uh, however, they're going to the system five message queue. So this means that jobs don't get backed up and jobs don't get delayed in core and they can continue working as if they don't know about the incident that's happening. Uh, and then when Kafka comes back up, it'll just drain the queue and we'll continue working. Of course, this queue is a limited size of the system five queue. So uh, if we don't solve the incident within like several hours, then there is the chance that we can lose messages in that case. Uh, for re-indexing, it's not a big deal. We can restart the re-index and we just lose time. But that is a drawback of the system. So I already kind of talked about this, but uh, so why the system five message queues? One, the jobs can be simpler because they don't have to know about Kafka. They're persistent against container restarts as well. Uh, and why we use Kafka, uh, like I said, the resiliency of Kafka is nice um, because once we produce to Kafka, it is persistent. And we know if Kafka goes down, that at least we don't lose Kafka data. The implicit replication by using the Kafka aggregate, uh, the offset committings, and of course, the order guarantees of Kafka, because if you write to a single partition in a Kafka topic, then you're guaranteed to have the order there. So we write all the documents for a single shop into one partition and like use a modulus to write to each partition in that Kafka topic. And then we can guarantee that the order is there and we're not overwriting documents. Um, so bringing it together then, uh, looking at like the whole view of Shopify, uh, we can see like the US East region, US Central region, and our Elasticsearch regions, uh, the Kafka regional in each region, the Kafka aggregate and our Elasticsearch clusters, and the flow then from each of those sharded pods to the regional Kafka and Elasticsearch. So after everything is re-indexed, say we started that re-index, the documents were produced to Kafka, they've been read by our consumer indexed, uh, we verified that everything completed successfully. 
we need to put this new index under production. Uh, it's pretty simple. We just change the alias name, and now the products index is products.1. Uh, we don't do any cache warming, which is kind of bad. Uh, <laughs> it, it means that there is like a small latency spike for merchants and users whenever we switch the index into production, but that latency spike, uh, since our query rate is high enough, goes down pretty quickly, so maybe a couple thousand queries um, hit a bad, get a bad query that times out, but that's something in our future plans to improve on. Um, so now, speaking of our future plans, uh, so the biggest problem that we have is MySQL query optimization. Going from this normalized format to a denormalized format in Elasticsearch is really hard uh, because like, like uh, you have to have a bunch of different associations with your queries. Like for our orders table, for example, there's close to 10 associations that had to be loaded up uh, just to build one document. And we have a maximum query time of 25 seconds in our core application. So if one of those queries times out, then that job has to retry, and hopefully it doesn't fail the next time. Uh, we do have some resiliency against those timeouts by decreasing the batch size that we request from Elasticsearch in the MySQL query. So when we query these order table and 10 associations on the order table, if it fails with a batch size of 1,000, then we'll try again with 500, and maybe it'll work then. But uh, it's tough. And then the second aspect of that is like pushing our products teams and educating them to think about the impact of these complex queries, uh, because we're not the ones writing these queries as well. We don't know when someone necessarily adds a new index or adds a new field. Uh, and so it's part of our work effort to educate product developers on how to write efficient MySQL queries, and that helps with reindexation as well. Another thing is we want to add shop level reindex concurrency. So, like I said, we reindex with one job per shop. Uh, there's shops that have, well, so there's shops that are legitimate, which have, for example, like this shop right here has 35 million documents in Elasticsearch, and that's 35 million orders, for example. Uh, but there's also shops like, if you've ever been scrolling on Facebook and you see like the like get your last name on a t-shirt ads on Facebook, those are Shopify stores sometimes. And those shops make a permutation of every single last name possible. And they store all of those documents on Shopify and they get into Elasticsearch so one shop could have five billion products that are just t-shirts. <laughs> uh, and re-indexing those sucks. So like here in this time series diagram, you can see this is the worker jobs, and most of them complete within the first like couple hours of when this re-index starts. But then there's always three or four shops that take up to like 24 hours until they can complete. So our long-term vision with this is to essentially split each of these shops into multiple worker jobs. And that way, we can have like 100 workers re-indexing the shops that are a problem. Um, so yeah, so pretty much what we've covered is, first of all, Elasticsearch at Shopify and how we run it for developers and our infrastructure, the Shopify core infrastructure, what re-indexing is for us, and how developers can add new mappings, top mappings and uh, analyzers and such, how we re-index at Shopify then after a developer does that, and our future plans. And that's everything. So. We still have time for a couple of questions, so if you have any, please raise your hand. I see you. Thank you for your awesome presentation. Um, <clears throat> those those re-index re-indexing jobs um, sometimes um, uh, fail for 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 reason uh, not known to a developer. Um, how long do you keep the old indexes, you know, the index.0, uh, for recovery or for failover? Yeah, um, so when we're re-indexing, the old index is still alive in production. Uh, so if that re-index fails, then there's really no impact. Uh, we just restart, delete the new index, do whatever we need to do to fix it. Once we switch the old index into production, um, we stop indexing in real time into the old index, so we can't go back to the old index. So once you've switched, it, that's it. Uh, but before we do switch, we verify that everything's good. We can send like shadow traffic to it. Uh, but yeah, we have had situations where we switched the index before we knew it was verified to be properly re-indexed, and uh, that was an incident. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? No? Perfect. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank it was you. amazing.